Hello, and welcome to the Inside Interviews podcast for September the 9th, 2022. This is episode 127. On today's show, we'll be talking about Jeep revealing three all-new electric vehicles, the official launch of the Chevrolet Equinox EV, the Neaf Nissan Leaf is getting bi-directional charging in the U.S., uh, what it's like to drive the Volkswagen ID Buzz, and extensive charging tests of the Kia EV9. I'm Dominic Yoni, Inside EV's forum moderator and Inside EV's editor. Joining us today is the insanely thorough Tom Malogny, Inside EV's editor and host of the YouTube channel State of Charge. We also have the maestro, Mr. Martin Lee, from the EV News Daily podcast, which is available on all the best podcast platforms. Welcome back from your vacation, Martin. I hope you had a great time. Um, actually, I'll ask you about that in a second. And of course... The, the mirthful Kyle Connor joins us from the majestic, practically palatial halls of out of spec studios, which closely resembles the interior of a BMW iX M60, where he produces high voltage videos for a growing number of YouTube channels. Okay, so before we get going, I'd like to ask that you please subscribe to this channel. If you're watching us on YouTube, please hit that thumbs up button and ring that bell icon for notifications so you'll know immediately when a new video is published. If you're watching us on Twitch, you can also ring that bell icon for not notifications. All right. So with that out of the way, welcome, everybody. I like so, Welcome back, Martin. Have a good time in your cabin in the woods. Yeah, but too many diesel vans driving past, stinking, <laughs> up, stinking up the place. Oh, really? You know, we're by the shore? Uh, no, we're in the middle of the forest, um, okay. near to uh, an American air base uh, that would uh, would have been used during World War II, but it's still, um, I think, occupied, uh, or rather, you're you're our guests. I think it's still a U.S. a U.S. air base, one of your uh, kind of um, uh, sort of bases in Europe, and uh, and so yeah, lots of aircraft activity, which I uh, enjoyed watching, uh, very right. loud. But yeah, no, it was the it was the vehicles on the ground. Which were the pain in the backside? Too far, okay. too many. You know, when you're in the in the middle of nowhere, in the forest, and uh, the deer were coming up to the back door to feed in the morning. We had some little grapes and some little cherry tomatoes to feed to the deer, uh, or as my toddler, my little boy calls it, the reindeer. Uh, and so we were, you know, feeding them out of our hands. And then there's the all the wildlife. Uh, and then you can, you know, after a couple of days, I think this happened in the first big lockdown that happened as well. You kind of yeah. Your nose clears a bit, doesn't it? And uh, and then you can really start to pick up different smells. And so, yeah, by the time we got back into reality, and I could really, uh, you know, and, and the diesel came past, it was pretty stinky. But uh, yeah, thoroughly loved it. Uh, a few more electric vehicles required in the forest, and that'd be lovely, please. Yes, well, we're, we're working on that. <laughs> we're, we're doing what we can. Uh, but uh, anyway, welcome back. We missed you, and it's good to have you back. Because yeah. thank you. Yeah, no, it's good uh, to be back. Oh, somebody, Pudgy Child is is asking, anyone else is going to fully charge live this in San Diego? I believe one of us may be on their way there. Yes. Yep, okay. On yeah. my way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, let's kick this thing off with some news, and then we'll get to what we've been driving this week, because we've been driving some great stuff, and I'm looking forward to hearing about that. Uh, so... Chevrolet and Jeep are competing for top news of the week, but let's start with something. Let's start with the uh, uh, Chevrolet Equinox EV. So coming to showrooms next year, the 2024 Chevrolet Equinox EV has officially launched, and we have a lot more details about what to expect. We've seen it before a couple of times in the past, so we have an idea of, of the exterior design and everything, but now we've got uh, like a lot more details. So the uh, Equinox EV is built on the Ultium platform. It comes in five trim levels, uh, 1 LT, 2 LT, 2 RS, 3 LT, and 3 RS. As you might have guessed, the RS trims are more sporty than the LTs. LT is LT1 is the base and will sell for about thirty thousand dollars. So uh, full pricing is one of the things Chevrolet has yet to reveal. So we're not sure how that compares with the rest of the lineup. The 1 LT is quite decontented. Uh, so it comes standard with four, front wheel drive. The uh, 1 LT. And it offers 250 miles of estimated range. All-wheel drive is optional, as is another 50 miles of range. So, which seems to indicate that the base one LT has a few uh, fewer modules, battery modules in its pack. All the other trims promise up to 300 miles of range in front-wheel drive configuration, and then also 280 miles in all-wheel drive. So, uh, real quickly, the onboard charger is 
uh, 11.5 kilowatts, about 34 miles an hour, which is great. Uh, but there's an optional 19.2 kilowatt or 51 mile an hour option for the 3RS. So peak DC fast charge power is 150 kilowatts across the board. And I, I believe that goes for the smaller battery in the 1LT as well. I didn't see any differentiation there. Uh, in front wheel drive, the Equinox puts out 210 horsepower, 242 pound feet of torque, which is great. Uh, all wheel drive cranks up the power to 290 and 346 pound feet of torque. So the 2RS, the sporty one, the cheaper sporty one, uh, will be the first to reach customers. That they say will be available in fall of 2023 with the rest coming in spring of 2024. So Tom, uh, this is the this is Chevrolet's second highest selling nameplate. Do you think they got the value equation right? So you know, I I went and took a look at the pricing on the the conventionally fueled Equinox, mm -hmm. and you know the 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 it sounds great. You know the their initial price is under thirty thousand dollars, but when you really get into the weeds with the different trims and the and the the all wheel drive version, it's going to be significantly more than. Uh, a gasoline version Equinox. And I'm a big fan of the Equinox. I've said this on the show. We owned one for about seven years. My wife loved it. I'm definitely, this is, this is on my radar uh, to get as a, as, as a vehicle for primarily my wife, my wife's uh, driving, but uh, I loved it too. So, you know, it's a lot's going to hinge on, I think the success of it and I, all, all overall, I love the package. I love how it looks. Uh, you know, I took some heat from here on the show. I was critical of the electric blazer. I just don't like the the styling on the blazer, sure. and that's okay. I'm I'm allowed to to like and not like how things look. Um, but um, there were a lot of negative comments because I kind of came out pretty hard and said I just don't really like this. In any event, even though the same styling cues are present in the Equinox, I just like how this is put together better. I just like the proportions. So um, love the vehicle. Uh, it's going to be important, I think, sales-wise, if the Equinox is going to qualify for federal tax incentives. Is it going to qualify for the mineral sourcings for the battery, for the battery component part? Yes, we assume it's going to be made at a plant here in the U.S., but that uh, doesn't get you anywhere. That's just get, getting you into through the front door of, uh, of possibly getting the federal incentive. Now, you, then there's it's broken up into two halves with the mineral sourcing and battery components. So, you know, I think to get this to where most Americans can afford it, it's got to qualify for at least half of that federal tax credit. Otherwise, there's going to be a big delta between the uh, a regular Equinox, which starts in like 22 or 23, I think now. 20, I mean, the, the loaded, top of the line, all-wheel drive, you know, uh, um, I forget what's the name of the trim. It used to be LTZ. It's not anymore. We had an LTZ. Uh, is thirty three thousand. So this is going to max out at around fifty grand, I think. So there's a big difference in in price, and I think that's really important. Uh, that you know, for 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 this to this is their mass market electric vehicle. Supposedly, this is you know going to be you know what everybody gets into. It has to be affordable for people to get into it. Love the package. Uh, but I'm really interested in seeing if it's going to qualify for 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 the tax credits. That's gonna that's gonna make or break massive sales for this. I think. So th for the tax credit, does it have to be assembled in the U.S. or can it be in, in Mexico and Canada as well? You know, I can't I, remember I, if it's I, North I, America I, off the top of my head. Yes, <laughs> no, it has to be yeah. U.S. manufacturing, oh, right? Okay. I think okay. the mineral sourcing and uh, can be from uh, a yeah. you know not just from, from from the U.S. It's it's from you know one of the countries that we have fair trade agreements with. Right. Um, that should be the actual problem. assembly has to be in in the U.S. Right. I think. Or I think maybe it's at, North America. I. I. It, it could be. You know. Yeah. I, because so it's been going on with this. That, I'm not that, sure of the exact rules. Johnny. Yeah. That was the Canadian celebration when it came out, and I think it also included Mexico, where right. the Mustang mm -hmm. Maki is made. Right. So yes, I know a couple a couple of the stronger lobbies who don't make their cars in the U.S. were fighting, uh, and some of the battery projects that are going to Canada uh, were fighting pretty hard. So that's yeah, I think you're right, Tom. Actually, that's why they were celebrating the North American slash trade agreement. Yeah. deal but yeah. but as you say this is it's all down to what is in the batteries and until now we've known a little bit like we know if a, if a car comes with an lfp battery a lithium-ion phosphate battery 
it hasn't got as much cobalt or any cobalt in, um, and therefore you're avoiding a lot of the uh, DRC issues, the fact mm -hmm. that all of the words cobalt is processed in China. Um, yep. So, you know, we've known the basics, and even then, look, we're, this is hardcore. We're on an EV podcast, on an EV channel, watched by people who like, and even then, you know, we're going to have to start getting into an unprecedented level of detail, asking our contacts at the car makers, like, where's your nickel coming from? And, you right. know, where's where's your manganese coming from? And and we've never had to worry, like, where, but not only where's it mined, but where's it processed? Yeah. And right. does that country have a trade agreement? Oh, it's, uh, it's wildly, ridiculously complicated. Absolutely. And that's, so, I've been trying to focus more on that. Uh, than the North America, U.S. manufacturing, because that's just that's just getting through, getting you through the front door. And I see we have like twenty comments saying it's North America. Okay, we we got that. Sorry, I wasn't one hundred percent clear on that because yeah, I've been trying to do really dig into mineral sourcing and 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 try to figure this out. And it's it's incredibly complex to find. Even when you reach out to the manufacturers, they can't give me a clear answer on it because a lot of the manufacturers get batteries from different sources so right. it's this is something that they're going to have teams of people working on at every company so they know exactly how they can source things and get the content to just the right amount so that it, it qualifies because that, that's going to be a big thing for these quote-unquote affordable electric vehicles it's not going to matter that much for uh you know a, a, a hundred thousand dollar rivian r1s uh, you know, everybody would love that to, to get an extra seventy five hundred dollars back, but the the buyer that's spending a hundred thousand is seventy five hundred is a lot less of a deal than somebody who's trying to get into a thirty two thousand dollar Equinox. Yeah, and that's really important in my opinion. Yeah. So this is built in. It's going to be produced at GM's Ramos Arizpe. Sorry, I, my I don't speak Spanish. Um, <laughs> in Mexico, anyway, it's it's going to be made in Mexico, probably close to the border. Um. And no, no dimensions were given, but I believe it's actually larger than the outgoing or the, than the gas equinox. It's like a longer, maybe by six or seven inches, uh, a bit wider, and but a little lower, a little lower roof, which is typical with EVs, you know. Uh, so that's that sort of offsets the the price increase, but still, it's it needs to be like that entry level vehicle, right? Like the, like the like you were saying, like the uh, the base gas version of the equinox is around twenty. Five eight, I believe, last night, but and it goes up to like thirty three, which is you know very yeah. reasonable. So it's yeah, that's why it's so popular. It's a great bang for your buck vehicle. We right. love ours, like I said, um, and uh, I'd love to get into an all electric Equinox, uh, but it, it's got to make sense, and hopefully it will once we learn all the details. Right now, it looks like it's a little on the expensive side. You know, when we first heard right. under thirty thousand. You know, you, you, you get excited about that, but then you, the devil's always in the details. That's for a really decontented, stripped down version. It uh, is. If you want to get something with all wheel drive, which a lot of people like, especially if people live in the northern states, we'd like to have all wheel drive here. Uh, and, um, you know, if, 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 if the price of entry pushes it up over 40,000, now it's now it's in a different class because, you know, you could get, I would imagine, a maxed out Equinox now, every mm. possible option. For, for for that. Yes, the total cost of ownership will still lower because it's going to cost less to fuel. It's going to cost yeah. less to maintenance, but that doesn't help the guy trying to get into it from the first place that right. can't afford that extra $40 a month payment on their, their, their financing or their leasing. So, um, you know, the overall cost is, I, I, I say this all the time. I do this when I do my dealer training. I try to have the salespeople explain to customers total cost of ownership, not what you're walking out of the door with. But, you know, number one, you know, people look at that MSRP. They look at the, the number that they're paying at the dealership. They can't look at the figure that they're paying over the next three years for fueling and maintenance. I know right. that makes sense. And I'm not trying to to talk down to people that they can't figure this stuff out. But most people aren't concerned with that. It's just a, a fact. I've dealt with this. I've worked with hundreds of dealerships. And it's it's that bottom line. It's what they're leaving the dealership with, what they know their monthly payment's going to be. Yeah. Even though they know it's going to cost them more for gas and maintenance, they, they, they're like, I'll deal with that later. You know, yeah. I need to get out of this dealership at, you know, 333 a month. I can't even go to 350 So it's it's a struggle. Awesome. Nebula is sharing with, oops, I was just going to about to click on that little comment. All right, right. Uh, Nebula 1701 was sharing that the GM also announced that Ramos Zippe will be exporting 
GMEVs to 45 countries. So that's a you know, global output there. Hey, Kyle, what's your opinion on this thing program? Yeah, I think think it's all good, to be honest. Specs wise, you know, especially if you option it up pretty good. I actually think it's fine in the base version as well. I know it's certainly decontented, but yeah. hey, at the end of the day, that's a pretty pretty good platform it seems for a sort of entry level trim so i'm excited about it can't wait to drive it um yeah i don't think it looks terrible i know tom doesn't like it so much um i don't think it looks great at all but honestly it's more about numbers on paper at this point but um to me i'm more excited about this than the blazer yeah i, I like this and styling wise i like that this doesn't really try hard it's just you know it's like a basic kind of like a you know like a basic good, like a you know, refrigerator or a freezer or or a car. I'm, but it, I mean, it looks okay. But it, it doesn't. It's not trying to look fancy. And I'll, oh, I also want to mention that the, the charge port door is just like a normal charge port door. There's no fancy mechanized whole half Thank of the fender. It doesn't need to be motorized or a swipe of the. Leave that to Porsche Taycons. Yeah. Yes. Let's just yeah. have a little flappy door like your your petrol filler. That's it's absolutely <laughs> fine. Right. And some, somebody also mentioned that they wished it was available in a rear wheel drive instead of front wheel drive. It, it's kind of funny that, uh, you know, like Chevrolet seems to be leaning more heavily on in front wheel drive and they're, when they, you go with a single motor and like uh, the and the Cadillac Lyric, you know, went rear wheel drive with a single motor. So within GM, it looks like there's going to be a little bit of uh, different takes on how things should be done, I guess. So it's kind of I'm kind of curious how uh, Buick's going to handle it. Because uh, that could be interesting for people who like front wheel, front wheel drive is very popular. So I, I don't want to discount that, you know, as a, like a like I'm I'm kind of biased against it, but a lot of people like it. So enjoy. I don't well, know. Well, I love the looks of this thing. I th I think yeah. it's a winner. I just hope the price can be palatable for you know the average American. Right. So I don't know if anybody wanted to say anything else about this. That's the, we're looking at the uh, three RS, the top of the line spec right there. And on the actually, it's kind of neat on the decontented LT1 version. That little uh, LED strip between the two headlight areas, or between the you know, is it's just plastic. There's no LED strip across all the way across the front, like on on this. That was oops, like there. It's like just black, which is a very small little detail. But this is a, an example of like the decontenting that's going on. <laughs> They do but, the same thing with the Lightning, with the Pro model. Well, the, there's no light bar that goes across. It's just on the sides, which that's we're right. going to talk a little bit about later. Yeah. Um, so let's move right along to the next story. Uh, so Jeep has been slow to electrify, but it's just revealed its ambitious plan to lead global SUV electrification. So the brand will introduce four zero emission vehicles uh, in North America and Europe by 2025. But uh, some of that is, comes pretty soon. Electrified models will be offered across the entire U.S. portfolio, including Wagoneer 4xe vehicles. 50% of sales in the U.S. and 100% of sales in Europe will be battery electric vehicles by 2030. The Stellantis brand revealed three all-new electric EVs that will debut by 2024 as part of this. Uh, the Jeep Avenger is a cross, and that's what we're looking at on the screen right now. The Jeep Avenger is a... A compact crossover for Europe. It's officially debuts on October 17th in Paris. So we'll have a lot more details on this coming up. And it's launching early next year. So this is coming soon to your shores, Martin. Uh, well, at least the European shores. We're not sure if the UK is included in that. It's with the steering wheel on the other side. but uh, <laughs> Well, look, let's, let's hope so. And let's hope it's there. It should all the, uh, be there kind of next generation under the skin as well. So this is really exciting, actually. Okay. And so the Jeep Recon is a, is the second one. And it's a boxy off-roader SUV with removable doors and glass with production starting in 2024 in North America. Reservations open up early 2023. So be prepared if this is like up your alley. I think this is a cool alternative to like a, a Scout. In the picture, it looks a little bit smaller than the Scout, but it's hard to tell the dimensions for sure. Maybe, maybe one of you all can set me straight here in a second. Um, so, and finally, the third vehicle is the Wagoneer S, uh, which is on our thumbnail today. And it's an SUV and leans more towards sophistication than ruggedness. Uh, this is the only one that gets any metrics mentioned. They're targeting 400 miles of range, which is great, of course, and 600 horsepower for a zero to 60 time of 3.5 seconds. So that's plenty, plenty quick. And, uh, so the, and the Recon and Wagoneer S are global products. 
So that right. So that's it. That's the big the big plan. So Kyle, a Jeep says it wants to lead in SUV electrification. Is this plan and this product enough to get it to that goal? You think? Well, we'll have to see what what the market thinks. Jeeps are hugely popular here in America, and it seems no matter if it's a good one or a bad one or a desirable one or not, people buy them. And it's sort of market independent as well. I see Jeeps everywhere from Michigan to Miami to LA. It's uh, and and not just Wranglers, all different types. So. You know, if anyone's going to take on the SUV market here, I think Jeep might. Now, in terms of how their products will be well received, we don't know too many specs on them yet. We don't know sort of final production grade styling yet, at least for all of them. So we'll have to see. But um, you know, if anyone can do it, Jeep can. And let's not forget how how huge Stellantis has uh, in terms of EV sales in Europe. They just haven't shown us in our market this yet. Right. Um it was oh i see it. it's over here uh i was just saying there's a comment that just came up here i want to mention right craig matsuba matsura um says it looks nice and ask what the range of the price is we don't know the price uh yet it's going to be a lot i would think and uh range with their hope like i said i think they're going for 400 miles which is a lot of range so i'm, I'm thinking with that kind of range and the kind of looks and looking at what they're doing, the high end, they've just released recently the, the the regular Wagoneer SUV, the gas version, and it's super high end. I'm not sure what the sticker on is, but I bet you it's like at least 80, right? Tom, you have an idea? The Wagoneer? Yeah, the, like the new one, the super nice little one. Yeah, at least 80. Um, yeah, you know, maybe. talking 400 miles of range. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if like the base you know, was 80, 79, nine. And, you know, to get it with any kind of options, you're over, well over 90. I mean, look, right. look, look what Rivian has to sell the R1S at. I mean, that's a perfect competitor for that. You know, they Rivian was trying to come out with a low price and they realized, especially in today's market and everything, they just couldn't do it with that price. So, um, I mean, we, 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 we already have that the electric Wagoneer. It just launched this week. It's called the Rivian R1S. So, I mean, I'm sure Jeep, I mean, Jeep has, as Kyle said, tremendous following, tremendous brand loyalty and anything yes. they put on the lot sells. I'm sure the electric versions are going to sell. Hopefully they will be good electric vehicles. Uh, you know, as, as Kyle said, also, we know Stellantis knows how to make electric vehicles. Uh, welcome to the party Jeep. Uh, let, let's get these things on the road. I think people are going to love them. Will it, will it satisfy every Jeep owner? No. You know, as Kyle points out many times, there's there's plenty of people that really love off-roading, serious off-roading. Uh, the fact that there's no not adequate infrastructure where there's long trails and you're really going to be doing this, that would m make it challenging. But most people that own Jeeps never off-road them. I mean, uh, here in, uh, in, in New Jersey, uh, so many of my friends have uh, Jeeps. They don't even see sand. So, you know, it's it's... <laughs> For those people, that it would it would be fine with uh, they wouldn't have to worry about ending up you know eighty miles in the backwoods and and uh, you know not having enough charge to get back uh, to civilization. Right, I like this Avenger looks pretty decent, but it's not coming here to North America. Unfortunately, I guess it's pretty on the small side. But maybe like it's like a Kona electric size. Well, look, that's and that's exactly the market that is really really interesting. That I think there'll be some interesting price. Um, kind of battles on over the next few years, which is good uh, because this sits exactly in MG ZS territory. So, right. you know, do you care what badge is on the front? Because like, you look at the back end shot, where are we there? That's not a million miles away from a Hyundai Kona, right? So do you care um, if it's a Hyundai or a Kia Nero and the new Nero slash E-Nero or Nero EV, I forget what they want it to call it called now, uh, is the you know, redesign of that looks pretty great. And then slightly more premium, of course, you've got the Volkswagen cars like the ID4. But this crossover segment of 30 something thousand pounds is getting really competitive. And that's great because it sits right in there with family monthly payment. Kind of uh, that's why they were making these these vehicles kind of hot spot. But it will drive competition and hopefully drive price down. Now, the, the, the specs that the Stellantis cars have been going with so far, so whether it's the Peugeots, the Opel Vauxhalls, um, has been the 100. Uh, kilowatt motor, 100 kilowatt DC fast charge peak, and 50 kilowatt hour battery. Uh, we know that in France, they're building um, at least one new facility that will be responsible for the next gen motors, and I think maybe the batteries, or perhaps cell assembly. Um, and 
you would think that with all the timing of this 23, 24, with that the new facilities coming online to make the next generation of what's under the skin, that it's all that step up um, and it's all that that fast charge rate that does get to a sensible kind of peak of 150, which is about right for a family. You know, our uh, our trip last week when I was off the podcast, we were 300 miles away, no, about 280 miles away um, in the MG ZS with a four-year-old who wants to stop every hour and a bit, you know, and uh, the fact that that car will charge, well, maximum 70 odd kilowatts, but let's be honest, 50 kilowatts, unless it's absolutely rinsed and it's got 1% in, and the battery is quite warm because we're driving a lot. By the time you stop, and take your kid in and and do what you've got to do and grab a coffee and get back the cars fully charged. So with this with these kind of cars we don't need to be worrying about anything faster than 125 150 kilowatt peak rate as long as the charging curve is sensible and the price is sensible as well and so anything in that ballpark is going to be absolutely fine for the next you know 2 to 5 to maybe six years or so before technology improves. But it's a really competitive bit of the market, and it's really exciting to see um, you know, what else is going to come, especially from the Chinese uh, companies as well, because then you start to layer in um, uh, what's the BYD one that was announced last week when I was off, the At- Atto 3 or something. So Yeah, um, I think so, yeah. You know, a little, that's a little more, it's late 30s, uh, but still, like, you know, lots of entrants into this bit. And uh, although it's a bit, a little bit depressing that everything is a crossover, um right. I, it's really it's really competitive and i'm excited about it so like we were saying like jeep is huge here does it, does it have much no. brand cachet in, in no. the uk nothing no. okay no because I, I i get the feeling it's gonna they're gonna charge a premium for it i don't know but and but it's does it it's probably sits on something that you already sell there right so it's yeah. like underneath is it a fiat or is it a peugeot or what is it yeah i imagine so uh it's their um stla Oh, right, the, right. Four, the four STLA platforms, but I forget which one it is that this will sit on, if they even mentioned it in, but that, that's what they're coming with anyway. Um, but no, Jeep's not really a thing. I mean, it's around. You see Grand Cherokees kind of flying <laughs> around, but um, no, not at all. No one aspires to really, you know, no one talks about a Jeep. You don't see any Jeeps really uh, on, on the roads too much. They are. I think they're, they're on sale. There must be some dealerships around, but um, I'll look into the annual sales. I don't think it's a lot. Okay. Uh, so, right. I, I really like that. Uh, I just want to say I really, really like that recon. I think that's going to be, uh, it's like almost like not green space. So it's like, but we, I wish a Bronco, I mean, the Bronco is supposed to be a great vehicle, but it, you know, it gets like this terrible gas mileage. So it's, but I really like this idea of the doors coming off. I thought I saw something about the roof coming off, but then I, then I don't know, maybe it doesn't, I don't know. Tom, did you see anything or Kyle, did you see anything about the roof coming off? Nope, haven't seen anything. No, me either. Okay. Oh, the glass comes out on the side. Maybe that's all it does. Just the, the doors and the glass, side glass. Anyway, I, I kind of I love that thing, and I'm I think it'll be popular uh, around T- Tallahassee. Is like a college town, and like the doors off of the Jeeps thing is is kind of popular thing here. So, yeah, looking forward to it. So let's move it along. Um, so Nissan has approved the first bi-directional charger for use with the Leaf electric car in the U.S. Formata's FE-15 bi-directional charger and its UL9741 certification, both passed critical certification requirements. So Tom, uh, there's not a whole lot of info here, including a price, but it's fair to say that this is going to be expensive up front. So basically this is a, a, a company called uh, Formata and they make some bi-directional chargers and they've just been certified to supply Nissan uh, these chargers for the Leaf so you can you know supply power to your house or grid with your with your Nissan Leaf um, right so in, in a test situation at a building in at the University of Boulder they said they were able to save like 250 bucks a month but for most EV owners it's, uh, I don't know does it does a system like this make sense now? Well, it depends on how much it costs, you know. And it's interesting to me that Nissan is uh, is is going in on this, n- knowing that they're retiring Chatamo. You know that the they they've already uh, announced that the the Leaf is is going to. Well, I don't know if they formally announced it, but we know that the Leaf is coming to an end in maybe two years, and uh, that's it for Chatamo. So it's interesting that they're not leaning all in on 
Vigil the grid with the 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 uh, Aria, you know, and 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 moving forward. I mean, I think it's great, and I think we need to do more vehicle to grid programs like this. And there's still tens of thousands of of Leafs driving around, if not you know more here in North America that can use these. So I mean, this is a technology that we need to explore more of. I, I have my uh, uh, my Lightning Charge Station Pro. I'm going to be installing that soon. That's a little different uh, than what than what this offers, but I mean, this is this is where we're going. This is the direction of electric vehicles, where the the vehicle can can give as well as take energy from the grid. So I mean, I, I don't know what the economics of this is. I have no idea what pricing is. I went to the website. I tried to figure out what the pricing was. They won't tell the pricing. That you, all you can do is send them an email yeah. and request a quote. So yeah. you know, it's 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 obviously going to be a really expensive item. But um, you know, I think it's great that we're 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 beginning to go down this road because that's the future of uh, electric vehicle charging. Right. They they already have some of this, I guess, for for with um, oh, I guess that's with with storage batteries with Tesla's um, you know, home batteries sharing on on sharing onto the grid and helping the like in California, that's really helping them out right now with this heat wave they're having and trying to keep the grid up. And they haven't actually had any brownouts, and I think that part of that is. That, that virtual virtual power plant network that with all those batteries coming together, so we could recreate a similar thing with this, with this kind of you know bidirectional charging. And I think actually, so a lot of people really you know worry that EVs that the grid cannot handle this influx of EVs, but it may be that EVs can actually help save the grid or keep it make it more robust with this with this two way you know power flow. I know. Did I did I miss it on my holidays, or have VW come with their solution yet for the CCS bi-directional? The ID four on the big batteries. Not uh, oh, that's not no. Yes, it has, and it's here in America, but not right. for the not for the hardware. But the cars are enabled. So because the over in Europe, Kyle, you've been driving cars, ID cars with the the updated software that gives you the uh, the the remaining balance, if you like. Right, we of, have it in the US too. You do now. Great. It's so, on new delivered ID4s. So uh, it, it counts down from something like 100,000 hours or so. It's like you'd have to be going some. It's there for battery protection, probably warranty protection ultimately. So yeah. if they're doing that with the, the software, I would imagine they must be close to announcing hardware partners. Now, my guess is there's going to be a different hardware partner for uh, North America versus Europe, perhaps even down to European country level. I don't think it's going to be one name that provides that and also different electrical standards around the world as well but they've got to be getting close it was meant to be done by now i think announcing their hardware partners and again it probably won't be cheap but that's that is more interesting to me like chatamo it's hard to say this without and i've never owned a leaf without then offending every leaf owner watching because you might have bought your car in good faith not you know not realizing but I mean, we we sort of have to stop building charging stations with so many Chatamo plugs. Look, I want leaf owners to charge where they want, like you know. But if it was if I was paying signing the bills, you know, it's, it's probably CCS, isn't it? Someone's so, just got to come up with an adapter, have a little communication uh, box, on. and and just it's not. I know it's happened in the past. Like it's it's technically possible. It's not it's not easy to carry this thing around because it was pretty janky. The one that I saw. But it's doable, so let's let's just get an adapter and argument mm -hmm. done. CCS only. Yeah. Now, now not so, so, you said someone's got to come up with this. Mm. BS. <laughs> Nissan has to come up with this. That's true. Nissan needs to make this for their legacy Leaf owners. They have to. I mean, it, it's 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 really a shame if they don't. These people bought the cars, didn't really know what the where the market was going. Even people are continuing to buy them now, and you have. Big networks like Electrify America saying, okay, no more Chatamo. We're not even installing them anymore in our new charging stations outside of California. California is forcing them to continue to install at least one Chatamo plug in every new location. But for the rest of the country, that's it. In Electrify America is not installing any more Chatamo. So, you know, these people that bought Nissan Leafs, they're, they're getting left hung out to dry. Nissan can do this. As Kyle said, it's not impossible. They've got... You know, even if they subcontract it out, just give somebody a boatload of money and say, make us one of these adapters. And we'll, mm. even if they don't give, I think they should give it to leaf owners, but okay, it's not my money. You know, even if they make it very affordable, sell it at cost. 
so that at least you own a leaf moving forward. There's there's going to be less and less Chatmo plugs out there. You can still charge your EV. So I mean, I think I think this completely rests on on Nissan's shoulders. Mm. And I wonder if that, like this this comment says, I want a conversion kit. Whether they mean as in a conversion, like you could do with Teslas. Uh, and and have them upgraded to CCS. I wonder if that means that they physically want an option to go back and and have the Chatamo taken out and a CCS plug put on the side of their car, the front of their their car. That would be really interesting. I don't see Nissan doing that. At all. I, I've talked to Nissan about this, and and I've heard a lot of people ask for that, and I believe that's what he's asking for, some type of a conversion kit. Um, and the, the people that I talked to at Nissan, and who knows if they're giving me the full truth, mm. said it's it's just not feasible like it would be cheaper to just give them a ten thousand dollar credit on a new car than like the the amount of cost it would cost to to rip the car apart to put this conversion in it's not a matter of changing the inlet there's a lot more yeah. that's involved and i'm not an engineer it, right. it's, i wouldn't think there'd be that much more but evidently there's a lot more involved than than just um that so they they said it's just that's not going to happen and of course, when you think about where the cars are made and designed, or design, um, is that in in Japan, when they sell the Aria, the Aria is going to be um, dual charging. It'll have a charger on each side. One side will be AC, I think, and then the other side is Chatmo, or one side is CCS, other side Chatmo. So, like uh, in their home market, they're not only not giving up on Chatmo; they're selling their brand new Aria flagship project uh, car. It's coming with Chatmo. So, uh, if you can put your minds where the company is then they're like well hey i mean chatamo's still a if you go to japan chatamo's everywhere so it's just only in japan um but it will be compatible with the new combined china shaoji standard so i i get it why they're not letting it go and actually chatamo's really good uh for many reasons um pretty reliable most of the time but still um, honestly yeah. if chatamo was higher power that may have been the standard we should have gone with but everyone yeah. went ccs which is more complicated at least the cable lets go when it's full. If you're up to a charger and someone, you take it out and put, put yours in. Yeah, but having two charge ports or a giant charge port for two connectors, that's not functional either. No. Right. Yeah, that's not the way forward, is it? All right. So that's, that's pretty cool, though. Oh, so and that's so this is a, a developing situation. But we have some other stories we want to talk to talk about before I get too deep into it here. Because we really need to talk about what we've been driving. So... Uh, Electrify America just introduced balanced charging and a new naming scheme. So apparently this it's, I don't know, it's Tom. <laughs> I see Martin <laughs> face palm already. <laughs> so it's not as bad as of, it sounds, Martin. Okay. No, I don't know. This has been a lot of chatter about this over the, over the last day um, with lots of opinions being voiced and stuff, but I don't know. Tom and Kyle have, you know, some strong opinions about this too. So I don't know, Tom, first, maybe just tell us, give us a baseline what's going on here. All right. So a couple of things. Um, Electro America is uh, uh, announced a new uh, charger that they're going to be installing now at uh, all of their new locations. It's a, it's a new look. It has an upgraded uh, screen. It's supposed to be clearer, easier to read. Uh, it's has only one uh, plug only one connector coming off the right side of the station. Previous units all had two connectors, even though you couldn't use two at once. And I can't tell you how many times I was doing charge recordings or something, and someone pulled up next to me and grabbed the connector, and I'm like, "You can't use that." And they're like, <laughs> they're, "They're thinking I'm not allowing them to." And I'm like, "No, right. it won't work." So it did confuse people. Uh, so now there's only one cable. The cable's 18 feet long, Great. which is I don't know what the current cables are. Kyle might know, but it's much longer than the current cable. So it should be able to reach anywhere on the car. The reason why they had the two connectors originally because they weren't long. And uh, you, if you, depending on which side of your the vehicle, the charge port was on cable, wouldn't reach. You'd have to stretch it over the hood and bend it. And these big thick cables don't like to bend. So now one cable will reach anywhere. Now the weird thing about that picture is you're, you're telling me, but Tom, it has two yeah. people <laughs> on it. That's an optical illusion. I told Electro America, they like they did the it's like the dumbest, it's the worst picture to have of this. That's actually two charging stations. There's oh, two chargers. Geez. One is behind the first one. So you're seeing the cable on the on the left hand side on uh, is is the cable 
uh, no, on the cable on the right hand side is the cable from the charger behind it. So, right. <laughs> I was so, confused. Yeah, exactly. And I, I even put that in my my uh, I, I put a little note on that in the in the article saying, hey, I know I'm telling you it only has one cable, but that's two chargers. So so, yeah, so that that's the look. That's what they're all going to look like now. There, there, there's no hole in the top anymore, which um, which kind of stinks for me because that's how I was. I have a like a tent that goes over the, the, the screen so it reduces the glare and I brace the tent through the hole on top of the charger. So now I've got to come up with a, a new way to, 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 to keep the glare off of the, the station when I charge unless I just start doing all my charge recordings at night. Anyway, I digress. So that's the first thing. Uh, now, uh, the second thing is they have new stickers, new n- new uh, branding for the units, supposedly to help make them easier for people to understand. The 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 charger number is located uh, at a different location because if you have to call customer support or even when you swipe the your app to activate a station, you have to tell them you have to tell the app which station you're at. It used to be way up on the top of the unit. And if people didn't know where it was, it would be hard for them to know what unit they were at. So now it's front and center. Now they also created these new labels that you're taking a look at there now. So the label, the top of the label shows which connector is on that charging station. So you can see Chatamo's on the left and the other three have CCS. And then it, then it tells you how fast of a charging station is. They have these new names. They just added hyper fast. They used right. to call all of their DC fast chargers ultra fast DC fast charging, but they wanted to differentiate between the 150 and 350 kilowatt stations. So now charging up to 150 kilowatt is ultra fast. Charging up to 350 kilowatt is now called hyper fast. The one problem I have with this is all the stickers are the same color. So you have to get on top of it to see hyper and 350. I think they should have made the hyper a different color. That's just my my input there. And then now take a look at the bottom. Uh, the 50 kilowatt station has one lightning bolt. The, th- the 150 has two. The 350 has three. And then all the way to the right now, we see balanced hyperfast. Oh. All of the new charging stations are going to have chargers that have balanced power, meaning two stations are going to share one cabinet and they're going to share power. Each station, uh, when you pull up, uh, supposedly you're guaranteed to be able to accept at least 150 kilowatts. So if somebody is charging on, say, a lucid air at over 300 kilowatt, uh, and then you pull up next to them, you're not going to get their table scraps. You know, you're not going to get uh, <laughs> 50 kilowatt. You'll right. pull 150 kilowatt if your vehicle's capable of it, and the lucid air will drop down to 200 kilowatt. So. Uh, you know, when you think about this, it sounds like um, it, it sounds like, oh, there. this is going to mean you're going to be charging slower. It really isn't going to make that much of a difference because very few EVs, first of all, charge higher than 150 kilowatt for a long period of time. Yeah, they'll peak at higher. But, uh, you know, if you pull up and there's a Tycon charging, let's say that can charge higher or a Lucid Air or something like that, unless he's there within the first 10 minutes of plugging in, He's probably already starting to ramp down to close to 150 kilowatts. So it's going to talk about a couple of minutes at most. It's going to add to your to your charging session. And uh, what this is doing is allowing Electrify America to uh, offer 350 kilowatt to more stations. So uh, on, on, on these balanced power site locations, more of the charging stations will be able to deliver 350 kilowatt as it is now. As you know, usually there's one or two stations maybe that are 350 and everything else is 150. Now more stations are going to offer higher charging. So, um, you know, that's I, I, I think it's a good compromise and and it allows Electrify America to to do this in more low to have higher power in more locations. In many instances, they're limited by the utility, what the utility will let them have, or they're going to incur tremendous demand charges if every station is 350. So this is going to allow them to spread the money out a little bit more evenly and put in more locations, uh, you know, around uh, the country. Hopefully, I mean that's 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 what we hope is the case. You know, they've got a lot to do. They've got a lot to work on with reliability. This is also 
hopefully going to improve reliability because this is their latest generation of, of, uh, of charging equipment. Kyle and I both talked to Rob Barrasso about this. We interviewed Rob, who, who came on our podcast four or five months ago. We both talked to him about network reliability. You know, obviously, they really didn't want to focus on this. This is their announcement on this new stuff. So they... They, they, they really they weren't making Rob available to talk about network reliability, but of course Kyle and I both pushed push back on that a little bit. And um, supposedly these new stations they've learned a lot now that they have all these other stations in the ground. They know what stations work, what stations don't, what components are repeatedly failing. They've made improvements to those. Uh, these stations also self-report better than the previous stations do. So supposedly Electrify America will know sooner when something is starting to operate out of its normal operating range so that they can ideally fix it quicker. I mean, whether or not they do, we don't know. Uh, service uh, and upkeep on the existing stations has not been up to what I think most users would call acceptable. So, um, you know, hopefully these new stations are more reliable. They're also going to be, in, in addition to installing them on their new sites, they're going to be looking at their entire network now and seeing the stations that are repeatedly failing, stations that are giving them a lot of problem, they're going to pull them out and put these new stations in that place. So they're going to be using these new stations to also upgrade their existing infrastructure. And uh, that's my take on it. Let's see what Kyle has to say. Well, you know, it's great to talk about the future, but I'm at an Electrify America station right now. I have to say, pissed off, just absolutely infuriated right now. Um, there's a ID4 owner who's a viewer of the podcast, viewer of our videos, who pulled up, plugged in. I'm charging up the IX here, you know, filming in Green River, Utah. He plugs in, gets 30 kilowatts. Mm. And he didn't realize. He's making logs, like he's logging his trip, looking at efficiency, all this stuff. But he didn't really realize it. And so I'm like, hey, just so you know, you're doing 30 kilowatts. He's like, what? We don't have all day. I'm like, I know. So then I'm like, all right, try that other station. Then he gets 40 kilowatts. And it's like, dude, what the heck's going on? So I know I had a really good charging session where I was getting. And by really good, I still wasn't getting full power. The IX on a 350 kilowatt charger with a 500 amp limit, which these chargers should have, should do 195 plus kilowatts. And I've done that many times. I was getting, of course, the 350 amp ABB limitation. But at the end of the day, um, you know, I was charged up pretty high and this had been going back and forth. He tried three other stalls and I'm like, all right, well, I know this one works. So I just moved the IX over. And now he's charging at pretty good speeds. Just got the thumbs up from him. Thanks for watching. And I think he'll tune into the podcast as well momentarily. And, um, you know, just uh, just an insane experience. So, yeah, lots of work needs to be done in reliability. These new stations could be the key to reliability. However, um, right now, it sucks. Yesterday, I got to a charging station that only one of four worked. Again, another viewer charging his ID4 kind enough to, like, live locally and was just getting the free juice. He's like, Hey dude, like you're here. I'm unplugging so you can charge. I'm like, that's pretty nice. Um, and really, really cool guy. But at the end of the day, um, certain regions of electrify America aren't having many issues with charging at all. We hear it from viewers. Hey, I plug in, it works every time. Tom doesn't have many issues, but out here where we have ABB chargers along our routes, these ABB units are just dropping like bricks, completely failing. It's hot weather, it's sensors, it's motherboards, it's everything, uh, except anything good. And so it's, absolutely terrible this road trip coming out here so far watching people scramble and charge the apps not giving accurate readings because they're doing updates to it uh, really a disaster at the moment i think this might be the worst we ever experienced but um you know in terms of future stuff i think they're going to be ripping out all the abb units or at least the majority of them and this is just my prediction and putting in their new chargers which are btc dispensers uh, the actual charging power is done from two different suppliers who Rob wouldn't tell me, but I'm going to one today to go explore. And, um, you know, we're going to stress test them. The way that they shift power between the two won't be 100% dynamic because the way chargers work, you have to go in stages of each individual charging brick. My understanding is both suppliers will have a little bit different uh, strategy on how to balance the power out between the plugs. So we'll have to test all of these things out. Um, the new labels doesn't matter to me. As long as there's a kilowatt rating on there, that's great. Everyone's coming up with this idea, that idea to call something this level seven, this, I mean, it 
it's whatever works we just all need to stick to so all of these ideas are not bad ideas chargeways idea is not a bad idea hyper ultra whatever stupid naming thing is not a bad idea as long as everyone uses it here's the thing no one's going to the one thing everyone's going to use is kilowatts you don't even need to understand what it is but you should know right. 350 is more than 150 right. we know 93 <laughs> octanes more than 91 and more than right. 87 right how so, why is this so hard yeah, it's not hard. And people are just trying to make it seem like drivers are dumb and people can't understand that a higher right. number means more. Now, the, <laughs> the one thing that none of this is explaining is helping people understand the maximum their car can take right. and plug in. My dad has a whole video on this. I think his take was awesome. It released yesterday when the embargo lifted and he walks through all of these different, you know, sort of social things that happen at chargers that that go on. Still, regardless if it's a hyper or an ultra, I'm still not sure which one's faster. Uh, people are going to plug into the fastest one thinking they're going to get faster charging. It doesn't really solve any problem. So uh, the big news for me is balanced or load managed charging, load share charging, simultaneous charging, whatever you want to call it. EA is calling it uh, balanced charging. Good idea. But still, they had the opportunity to redesign the way their sites would work. And they didn't go with the centralized dispersed DC load like we've seen from the Zeus Marshausen future of charging stations I showed, like we've seen from chem power stations. It's still just one unit split to two posts. It should be one unit split to 20. Should be one charging station as one converter has a battery pack. If you have the opportunity to rethink everything, load manage the whole site. Doesn't matter what plug you plug into anywhere. It'll try and give you everything it can. So I feel like we're just, you know, five years behind here in the US and still mm -hmm. continuing, but at least we'll have chargers that work assuming the hardware that they've had so much time and influence working on works. That's the big if. Right. If this new hardware sucks, we're screwed. Yeah. Sorry to have such a rude take about no, it. But no, no, not at all. No, it's well, look, frustrating. Uh, no, like, yeah, as, you're, a, you're... As, as a comparison, I will tell you about um, my charging on my, my break last week. So I pulled into uh, something called GridServe. Um, they're building a thing called electric forecourts over here where they have 20, 30, 40 charges. Um, and there's a newly opened one that perhaps has 30 or 32 chargers. Um, pretty quiet when I turned up, and I did. Uh, it's uh, I'll bring it up on screen. It's um, it's got you know a coffee shop. It's got meeting pods. Um, it's got a small supermarket inside if you want to do your shopping. Um, it has uh, yeah, like a, a nice uh, you know a nice area for waiting. Good seating inside. It's all covered. And um, Ooh, uh, nice. I I did like a, a lap. Uh, a, a lap of it uh, around the outside, and in the end, I, I pulled in and unplugged in uh, to a charger. And I did that because, um, as you know, the the MG drives uh, charges dogs slow. And what was great about because this is a facility and they've got a barista inside making the coffee, and they've got staff around, they've got people cleaning the toilets, and uh, a guy in a, a high vis yellow jacket walked up to me as I was plugging in. He was like, "Hey, just checking in. You're okay. Do you know what you're doing? You, 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 you look like what you're doing, so I won't interfere." That, that was amazing. They had somebody nice. on, like a concierge. Okay, yeah. it was the middle of the day. I'm sure it doesn't happen at 2 a.m. But a guy just came over really friendly, not pushy, not patronizing. Are you okay? And I'm, yeah, no, I'm good. And I said, I did a quick lap because, I, I, you know, the MG charges slowly. And I want to plug into a 150, not a 350, because it's just polite, even though it's quiet here. And he laughed. And he went, we only put 350s in. And I'm like, oh. oh. And I said, because I said to him, wouldn't it be cool? Before he said that, I said, it'd be really good. Um, if you actually put on the floor 150 or 350, I've seen sites right. that do that. They paint it in red or uh, normally blue or green paint. Um, you know, a big 150 or a big 350. I said, if you did that, this site would be perfect. And he laughed. That's when he went, we only put 350s in. <laughs> like, all you need to remember is these are all 350. That's and, there's like, strategy, and there's like, and there's like 30 of them. And that's all And that's all we do. And I'm, oh, man, I didn't even realize that, um, which is amazing. Uh, so that was an awesome, awesome experience. And you know, I don't know, you know, the, the, the cost would have been huge. The ROI is probably horrible. Um, I'm glad I didn't pay for it, but it's great. You know, we got some lunch at M&S. Um, we got coffees. Um, and, uh, and, we, and we were there longer than we would have been otherwise, I think, because it was empty. We charged like 90% because there was no one else around. And they got some decent money out of me. Um, and, and if more places did this, a, like a destination, then... I don't know what I spent, maybe 20, 25 pounds on, you know, two coffees, some sandwiches, the charging as well. That's you know, that's a decent amount. Um, I'd love I'd love for there to be more places like that. It's, it is incredible. It's brilliant. 
I love it, but I'm just curious, like how how many meeting pods get actually used for like meetings? What, yeah, what? Uh, well, this is on a pretty <laughs> this is a pretty main location, and there were two, and it was empty. Um, so how how many of those get booked? I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I, I don't know what. I appreciated a nice bathroom, and honestly, it was like yeah. you know, it was like funky hotel nice. It wasn't, you know, yeah. and there was someone there cleaning them. It was nice, yes, and there was there nice. was sofas, um, and then they had three or four little games machines for kids. Uh, honestly, I mean, just incredible. Sweet. All right. Uh, before we move on, one of the things I did talk to Rob about that he kind of um, didn't really address was. The fact that the exist this is all well and great. I think it's positive. I think some of the moves are great. I understand Kyle's frustration. He wants everything to work. He wants it to work right now. He's on a road trip. Hopefully, this is going to improve, make it improve. Hopefully, let's see. Um, but one of the things they really don't seem to be improving is the number of locates of chargers at each location. And right now we're getting to a point where, um, at least here in the East Coast, where they're, they're filling up. And, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's, we never had to wait. We never had to, you know, it was Kyle and I were the only ones there half the times so we could set up our camera equipment and everything. Now I'm fighting for a spot to get a charger. So, you know, I, I, I hope that Electro America begins to add locations to add chargers to the locations. They see high utilization because they, and I've talked to them about this in the past. They said they've in many of their locations, they already have agreements in place with the site owner that, you know, at the future, whenever they need to, they can boom, 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 add two, three, four more charging stations. And, you know, we haven't seen that yet. I, I don't I haven't seen any stations expanded. I don't know if anybody else has seen that, but we're getting to the point where we're going to be needing that really soon. So hopefully. Uh, you know, maybe they'll start at the locations where they're going to be ripping out the old chargers that haven't been working and installing them with the new ones. Uh, they can see the utilization. They can see we're at 100% occupied for two hours. But what they can't see is during those two hours, seven or eight EVs pulled up and then just drove away because they 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 know they're three in the queue and they're not going to wait 45 minutes before they can plug in. So I think that's something that's really important. And we also... I know Kyle mentioned it. He says, dad did a video on it. The in, in uh, trying to figure out a way to, to educate the, the customers on which station they should be pulling at. I fear that this new branding with the ultra and the hyper, everyone's going to be saying, Oh, I want a hyper station because you know, it's going to charge my car faster. Now it's really in your face. It wasn't in your face before it had the 350, the 150 down below. But honestly, I think people didn't even realize it. Uh, half the time. But I think more people are going to realize it now because it's in your face, hyper, ultra. And I think, you know, you're going to have these people with EVs that can't even pull 100 kilowatts saying, I want to go to a hyper station because it charges faster. I get that all the time now when I'm doing my DC fast charge recordings and I need a 350 kilowatt unit, the locations around me have one maybe, and I'll pull up and there'll be like a, you know, a, a 2019 Kona there that's and he and he's at 25 percent state of charge and i i know this guy's going to charge to 100 <laughs> he's going to be there an hour and 45 minutes and i'm like dude i'll pay you if you move you know like what's is it ten dollars is it twenty dollars what's your number you know just <laughs> just move you know first i'll try i'll try the you know you know you'll charge just as fast over there and then, no 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 this is at 350 and i'm like yeah but see that number down there that's how much your car's pulling it says 66 you know mm -hmm. like the 150 is still way more than 66 and they don't want to hear it you know some people listen uh, i say they a lot of people listen to me and say, oh, thank you for educating me. I didn't realize that. Yeah, I'll move over for you. But, you know, I get the people that just roll up the window and they're like, I was here first. E <laughs> the window goes up, you know, and I'm like, all right, thanks, buddy. You know, I'm trying to be nice, you know, but, yeah. um, you know, uh, it would be great if we could figure out a way of, of educating people on this, you know, and, and uh, you know, it, it should happen at the dealership. We know it's probably not going to. So, right. and I talked to EA about this and I even wrote it in my article a little bit that, you know, I think some of the burden falls on them. Why don't they put out some videos? Why don't they, you know, I'm not saying spend a ton of money on it, but do mm. some type of a public uh, campaign. Okay. Right. You know, I'm going to an EA station, which, which charging station should I use? Uh, I think it would be helpful. When you say that the charging networks have no idea on who's turning up and turning away, that is where Tesla wins. 
that is where uh, true. The, right. the, the integration of hardware and software, I know the, the internet you know, lost its mind this week because of the new Apple iPhone that has the little moving uh, the island, what's it called? The island something, you know, where the, the, the dynamic it, it, island. Yeah, the right. Apple I, name ever. I like, but you know, and but that's true, right? That is that it's hardware led because they've got to have a little black notch at the top of the screen, and then software enabled it does other things. So I woke up that, early and ordered one. I love that. <laughs> it looks it's so cool. I want one. But that's where Tesla wins because Tesla can see exactly who's navigating to a supercharger, and they can follow their car on GPS. And if they get there and it's full and they turn around, they know that data. And that is, you know, you can see right now, Kyle is in a car that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars and that is a significantly worse experience than tesla can give somebody in their entry model yeah now to be um, fair i only had to choose three stalls the third one gave me full power the okay. guy in the id4 <laughs> had to ask me to move so you know <laughs> all right hey so let's let's move along to uh, what we've been driving this week because yeah I'm, I've been Don, let, to get this. let me just cut him one oh, second sorry oh, okay. um uh, hopefully the Sorry. new balanced power ba balanced mm. charging stations uh will eliminate this problem because if 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 the whole site can deliver the same amount of power there we're not fighting for that one 350 at every location so th that that right. might help to mitigate this problem uh you know if there's a you know you won't have a bolt uh, you know charging at you know <laughs> 2 miles an hour uh, at a 350 kilowatt unit and you know you pull up at five percent with your Tycon and you're pulling your hair out of your head because now you, you've got to you know plug into a 150 so th yeah, this should Tom's change gonna, it. Tom you're just going to carry around traffic cones and block out the other shared charger when you have to do be like <laughs> offline don't no, go near yeah. it <laughs> I, I, yeah. ha I have a confession to make uh -oh. <laughs> once oh, <no. laughs> once at a Tesla supercharger when I was I was at a, a, a v2 supercharger and it was a pretty busy site and I didn't want it to split the power. I put an out of order sign on yeah. the charger. Good man. I taped it <laughs> on the charger. Oh and, no! And and, uh, <laughs> I, and, uh, and I got my recording in. And I, I'm sorry. I'm oh, sorry I if won't anybody ever go that waited. Far. I'll I'll always move. <laughs> I showed up with a sign. I was I I was premeditated. It wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I, I taped it around the thing and everything <laughs> out of order. Was it lam I'm was it sorry. laminated? Had you had it laminated just to you know? No, it was deal. marker, <laughs> but it was it, it worked. Nobody used it, and there were people waiting. I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> oh hey, All uh, right. also well also sorry, Dom. Massive uh, <laughs> digression. Um, <laughs> I pulled in. I pulled in to use one of the handful of sites uh, that is an open Tesla supercharger. I didn't need to charge just because. Um, and firstly, the look on the faces of everyone else there. Like they obviously hadn't heard that because they were just already confused. They're like, that car's not going to work here. And I'm like, no, this is one of the eight or 10 sites. It's in somewhere called Fetford or Elverdon Forest. Um, it's one of the open ones. And hey, look, here's the app. And I've got my key uh -huh. and I just hit start. Uh, and uh, it wouldn't work with the MG. So they were like, we told you. I'm like, no, honestly, it does. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, uh, plugging in, long handshake uh, would give up. And then um, the car was waiting, Tesla was waiting. Whether it's an MG, I don't know anyone else that's tried the MG um, on the Tesla superchargers, uh, but uh, my experience of it just would not handshake and I, it just timed out. I tried three or four times. I had um, that with the Polestar. Really? Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Speeding recently. So not flawless yet then. Interesting. Nope. And I looked okay. like such an idiot because obviously you could see all the Tesla guys saying, oh, you can't charge it. They're all thinking <laughs> right, this. Right. And then I really couldn't charge there. Even yeah. though <laughs> I, I felt Dang like it. a complete idiot. And all then right. they just watched me dawdle across the street like a little scared <laughs> sheep going back to the, the ABB back, chargers back over there. Back to your side. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, okay, let, let's move on. I could, I could I really want to talk about Tesla superchargers, but they're great. And Tesla's doing a super job of it. Um, but let's talk about the VW ID buzz a little bit because Kyle, you drove this in Germany recently, but you couldn't tell us about the driving experience, but that embargo has dropped and you have a video out now, two videos telling us about driving the ID buzz and the ID buzz cargo. Um, so well, we can go watch those, but maybe just give us an synopsis or you know what you think. 
Yeah, well, for our keen viewers, there's actually five videos on the ID Buzz, all scattered around different parts of YouTube. So see oh. if you can find them all. Uh, but really, no, it's uh, fantastic. I was in Copenhagen, Denmark with it. It was really just an absolute um, a blast. But, you know, th I can keep this really short. I've already taken everyone on a tour of the car. We've discussed the ID Buzz many times. Yeah. Um, and, and really, to boil it down, it drives like a big ID4. There's, that's all you have to say. All okay. of the inputs, the pedals, the sounds, the way everything operates, it's just a big ID4. Nice. I mean, I like the ID4. It's, it's got, great. Did, did you drive uh, all-wheel drive and rear-wheel drive? No, they don't make an all-wheel drive. It is just a rear-wheel drive at the moment. Oh, in Europe, right. So did it yep. have that, that, has that crazy small turning radius then? Yeah, very, very tight turning radius. And I actually compared uh, the smaller wheels on the cargo version. Okay. I found the most base one I could. And that had an even better turning radius, in my impression, than the one with the bigger wheels. Don't know if that's coincidence or if I'm just, just feeling things. But it's really a great van. You know what? At the end of the day, it's just happy. It just improves your day. Now, the one we're going to get in the U.S. is going to be the long wheelbase, the big battery, probably leatherette seating, which I don't even think is available in Europe at the moment. And I just hope they don't go the way of the Volkswagen Rutan and they keep it really fun and happy for the U.S. market. Because my understanding is they haven't finalized the U.S. spec yet, but I really want the fun colors. We want the good interiors. Uh, you know, we want to keep it super cool. And I'm not sure Volkswagen has the right or at least the same idea. We'll have to see. I'm not totally sure. I so, know they they know there's a market to keep it fun and happy, though. So you have a friend that does all that kind of stuff for Volkswagen, decide what specs we're going to get over here, right? Don't you? It's... No, uh, no longer with the company. Oh. Yep. Oh. Okay. So I guess we need to find the replacement. I mean, I know yeah. the replacement. Cool dude, too. But oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, ah. I would say, you know, it's, it's also up to just proving numbers and trying to fig fix it in segment you know at the end of the day everyone wants it to be a fun van i think they're going to do it i know we're only getting dual tone in the u.s uh for for two-tone colors which is a great step i'm sure we're only going to get some nicer options similar to the id4 we don't know the price in america um and we don't really know the full specs for example the standard wheelbase has no rear air vents the rear windows don't go down there's no cup holders back there other than these little flimsy things so Ooh. it's like to me they made this van and then totally forgot about the back seat it's just a huge oversight and um, my understanding is the long wheelbase will have some of those things but right. they they really messed up the back seat of this van in my opinion they put USB-C ports in the sliding doors. And as the doors open, your USB uh, port with everything <laughs> plugged into it flies back and it goes through this little tiny space. So like your oh, no. iPad's not going to fit through there. So it's just going to destroy the side of the car. It's going to rip the port out. And and it's just not, it's not well thought out in the back at all. So for van life, for two people up front, for, for that's fine. No issues with that. But for right. the rear seat... I was very disappointed with the whole with the whole thing. And you can tell they compensated with the front air conditioning because it, it doesn't even have any vents in the back um, that it just gets so ice cold up front. So you'll just be shivering driving <laughs> and, and the guys in the back still won't be cold. Mm, interesting. OK, so not a perfect product then is what you're saying. No, it drives wonderfully. It's built right seemingly really well it has some wind noise but great driver assistance it's not meant to be fast or a handling vehicle although it is right. fun to drive quickly because it's wrong to do things in cars uh you know it's fun to do wrong things in cars and uh you know overall it's it's really a nice package but if you're buying it to move your family around i'm not sure it's the right choice right what's At your favorite not until we get the combo. us spec. yeah um so I think this this launch yellow is pretty nice. I like it quite a bit. But there was also a gray or this dark blue, gray and white that looked really classy. And then there was one that looked really awesome that was just completely blacked out on the big blingy wheels. And I was like, oh, that's a dubbed out ID buzz. That thing looked good. So, okay. yeah, there's, the, you can really spec it kind of however you want. I, I like them all. I like it from the base cargo version to the most luxurious one they have. It was It's really just a all around great car really is but Sweet, but yeah. that back seat it, there's no excuse for that right hey, in the in the cargo version does it look like it'd be a great uh, like a camper van conversion like would, would that be a good, great place to camp with yeah they they even have a whole slide in version 
uh, a little bed with a cooking thing that comes out and oh. um, and it'll be available from Volkswagen accessories to turn it into a van nice. or van life. Nice. We need to see more about that. Is, is that yeah, in your I, video? Yep. No. Put a whole segment in there about it, showed how it all works and uh, okay. yep, it's all in there. Sweet. It's in the passenger one. It's not designed for the cargo. I believe it's designed for the passenger version. Oh, oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. hmm. Maybe it works in both, but my understanding is this slides in over when the seats are all folded down. All right. So we, we don't have a whole lot of time. So let's move on to the uh, BMW iX M60 that you're driving right now. You, you've been putting a bunch of miles on recently, but you you took it for a, a highway range test. This is the full jalapeno spicy version of the BMW iX. So we're thinking like less range. I don't know. What, what's the EPA range on that? Yeah, so it's 274 miles, and I knew it would do okay because I was driving it a bit, and it just seemed to just coast and coast, and um, you know, really little drivetrain friction, and you know, just seemed seemed to be really aero. Um, and I know Tom did a range test on the 50 and got 345 miles. Was it Tom with the aero wheels? So that was in the best spec version, and I knew this was going to do a little bit less, but I didn't expect it to do as well as it did. You know, 274 mile EPA versus the one Tom drove, which was 330 mile EPA, if I remember correctly. That's a huge spread. Yeah. However, at the end of the day, our results were within five miles of each other. So wow. this thing, this thing went 339 miles, 340 what? miles. At 70 miles an hour with the 22 inch wheels, which in the M60 <gasps> do actually give it less range than the 21s. It's 280 with the 21s, 274 with the 22s. And you pretty much lose no range over apparently the 50 with the arrow wheels. Now, I'd love to run them back to back on the same Jeez. day in the same conditions, of course, but yeah. it was, it was, a, it was really hot. It was 100 degrees for most of the drive. Um, you know, AC working along as normal, and it did 339 miles. 3.1 miles per kilowatt hour in something this big uh, is truly impressive. And I just put up a video today of the most efficient Tesla Model X because everyone commented, oh, my Model X will go farther. And guess yeah. what? It didn't go as far. The, the right. most efficient Model X didn't go as far as the least efficient iX. So to, and, and just, to re, just so everyone's clear, this wasn't like all downhill. This was like a loop style. So you did yep. the same same elevations back and forth yep. to cancel out any, any changes like, like that. That's an yep. amazing result. And I ran the Model X in similar conditions. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, the Model X has less usable capacity. So that's where that came from, because the Model X was actually more efficient at the end of the drive. Okay. Uh, so, you know, BMW has a slightly larger battery pack in it. Weird thing is I was, you know, this has 105 kilowatt hours usable. The IX has, uh, we don't actually know Tesla doesn't state, but it's about a hundred kilowatt hour battery pack. I was, uh, I hit 0% at 90 kilowatt hours in the model X. And I know there's a three kilowatt hour buffer at the bottom. So I went all the way to 93 kilowatt hours and a bit past like this thing was out. So I gave it every last chance I could to the model X, but still 93 kilowatt hours doesn't seem like enough. The car's relatively fresh. It had under 10,000 miles. Like it's been well cared for. I know the owner, He's a friend of mine. So it didn't seem like the Model X had all the available capacity in it. However, someone did just comment on that video because it just went up the Model X that maybe um, that the climate control isn't counting towards the energy used. But I'm pretty oh. sure it is. But it's just a theory. Okay. Interesting. Well, awesome. Um, and, and anything else about the X you want to tell us about? Cause you've been, you've had some spent, got to spend some more time with it now. I know we, we've been pretty effusive about, uh, you know, how much we like it, uh, yep. or you and Tom like it. It's so. really great. Although I've had it parked next to the e-tron all week and I still find myself taking the e-tron places. Um, okay. yeah, there's something about the seats in this car that I'm not totally loving. They look really nice, but the massage kind of sucks. And, um, I really don't like the weird shape of the steering wheel, which is this kind of, right squared Square. off thing i just yeah. find it not nice to maneuver the wheel um but but you know i full charge this thing um well actually it recommends a full charge before you full charge it but it was 430 miles 440 miles predicted at 100 percent coming out of the rockies of course downhill but 
huge range, stellar sound system, the Bowers and Wilkins, one of the best sound systems I've ever heard. And uh, it's just eaten up the miles on this trip. It's really a great car. You just have to ignore the front end. And it's kind of a shame that you have to go, but ignore the front end. If they just fix that, then it would be the end all be all. This is the luxury SUV you need. But EQS SUV launches this week in America. R1S is now on sale. All of these things are coming on the market. You know, competition stiff. Yeah. Yeah, but there's a big market. There's a lot of people ready to, you know, trade in their gas cars, jump into electric, or just upgrade a car. And that's, you know, man. Um, yeah. So, uh, we, oh, yeah. We wanted to hear about your, before we get, get to Tom, we wanted to hear about your Porsche Taycan Autobahn little jaunt that you did. I didn't get the chance to watch the whole video, so I don't know the result. I just watched the beginning of it. You get a oh, that's Porsche a Taycan video. Sport Turismo. Yeah. What's that? What'd you say? It's a pretty silly video. I just tried to see what right. was the least efficient. I could be given reasonable driving conditions. And yeah. Autobahn at nighttime. Yeah, at nighttime, top speed, but then there's also construction zones. There's uh, other cars. You know, it's not just like flat out the whole time because I wanted to paint what you know, what's the worst case scenario for road tripping in an EV? And that's Germany with with de-restricted Autobahn, but right. also keeping it realistic there's construction zones there's other stuff going on and i drove it harder than i think most people would uh and i got about uh one mile per kilowatt hour okay and how, how many kilowatt hours is there in the sport turismo uh, you have 93 usable i want to say okay. but so, uh, again when you're pulling that much power there's a lot of heat loss so you're not able to get the full capacity of the pack right. so you're into this thing it's 60 to 70 miles on a full charge Woo. Yeah, but, <laughs> but you can just slow down and extend the range, of course. But sure. I just wanted to know for my own planning. I find right. that the car really loves cruising between 220 and 240 kilometers per hour is where this thing loves to sit two, 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 all yes. day. 125, 130 miles an hour and up. Yep. Yeah. 130 to 150 is its sweet spot. Okay. Yeah, and it, it'll just do it all day. And I took it on a road trip, and I have a whole bunch of out of spec motoring road trips to to upload and edit. But I took it on a 1400 kilometer round trip road trip in a day and um it really painted the picture of the charging infrastructure in germany blowing away everything else every single stop first of all i didn't plan any routes i my whole theory was i'm going to drive this thing as fast as i can up to dusseldorf and back i'm going to plug in whenever i'm at very low state of charge i'm not going to do any route planning and porsche has a great route planner into it and it'll get you to chargers down to one percent it's so accurate you can really play around with it and so I was pulling into chargers dead, charging up 260, 270 kilowatts to 50%. As soon as it tapered, I was unplugging at 220 kilowatts. I was like, this is way too slow. Let's go to the next. And um, and just hammered it the whole way. There's 300 plus kilowatt chargers off of almost every exit. Every single time there was a charger with plug and charge, it worked. Every single time I plugged into a charger, I got max speeds instantly, no fuss. It was the perfect road trip and i had again because i was driving so fast a ton of charging sessions and it just shows that like okay i've only done three charging sessions on this trip in the ix and each one has had something wrong with it and i did like 20 in one day and a higher charging power car and had zero zero issues at all it's just wow. like we're so far behind here so it is possible but it's not here yet basically it was what you're saying as far as infrastructure goes it's getting worse here by the day because these abb units just keep failing signets are doing pretty well the btcs have some issues but they're relatively okay but it's really just the stations that have a lot of abb chargers are mm. dropping like flies and and ea can't either get parts for them or whatever's going on i don't know i'm not on the inside i don't know the situation but i know I know Electrify America is frustrated. I know ABB is frustrated because those guys have been calling me every day and being like, hey, you know, oh, why oh. you keep knocking our chargers? And I'm like, dude, your chargers <laughs> suck. Um, so... <laughs> 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 like, I pull up. It says ABB. It doesn't work. Meanwhile, we have mostly Signet here in New Jersey in the area right. here. And that's why I think. Uh, you, you don't hear me complain as much because I really don't have many problems. You know, I just went 1100 mile trip from New Jersey to Connecticut through New York, up into Canada, and then back didn't have one single problem. Every time I just plugged in plug and charge on my lightning, just started working. 
you know, and, 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 and it was, it was no problem at all. So I can't complain about what I'm not experiencing, but that doesn't mean that I don't understand that people are having real problems. You know, I, I see the tweets on Twitter. I see Kyle complaining. I see Jordan complaining. I see a, a bunch of people that I know online, you know, complaining about the charging and I'm not discounting it, but I report what I experience and sure. I really don't have very many problems here. And, and my dad says the same thing. It's so much better on the East Coast when they ripped out all the Efesec chargers that were having issues mm. and they replaced them with the Signets. That was the move. And who would have ever thought Signet would have the most reliable charging? Those guys were crap years ago. So, I mean, it's I would have put my money on ABB. But, but here's the thing. This is the Green River charging station where I am. The one I'm plugged into won't give more than 45 kilowatts. The one behind it won't give more than 30. This one won't give more than 30. And only the left handle on that one will give 350 amps, which on this car is 150 kilowatts when it should be giving it about 200. And so here's four stops. You have to stop at this, this corridor. This is like a needed spot. And there's only one charger that can charge cars quickly. This is the situation we're dealing with. And it's just where I am at the moment. Right. Well, we got a uh, comment earlier from uh, Merchi Bautista. He says the Signet units in Salina, Utah work flawless. Yeah, Be sure to make that really stop, do. Kyle. I, that, I try and hit that one every time. Okay. It's a great stop. And it's out Sweet. of Loves. Okay. That's nice. Uh, Mark Fitzpatrick says we have Signet in Ohio, too. Um, okay. So let's uh, we getting low on time. But I, Tom, we need to hear about your Ford F-150, what you've done uh, we got a couple of things actually. I've got you here for the your F one fifty light your lightning tint job. I yeah, want to hear what's anything news on your Rivian order and Kia EV six fast charging. You did crazy. Okay, so really video quickly, I see Martin pulled up. You see that's the light bar on the F one fifty lightning, which I love, but it's this milky white plastic that like it you really doesn't even do justice with the picture there it's it's i just didn't like the look of it sure. so i tinted it and now martin's going to show as i tint it i used lux uh light tint it's made to tint lights so it's super dark but yet light shines through it now not 100 percent of the light but this the light bar is made for just uh just for show just for looks it yeah. doesn't light up the area much it's really completely just to, to, to have a really cool look. So you still get that look, even though it doesn't allow all the light to shine through. But I mean, you at, at night, I don't know. I, I know I have a, uh, I put up a tweet, uh, a tweet that shows it at light when it's light lighting up. I don't know if Martin can, can get that it's in this article, but it, you definitely do see the light coming through it. So th that's just kind of like a cosmetic upgrade. The F-150 Lightning community seems to love it. I've gotten tons of messages and email. Tom, where did you get this done? Uh, you know, uh, where can I get this tint? Did you do it yourself? I didn't do it myself. There's so many angles and uh, of the lights. Even my tint guy, the guy who's a professional tint guy, has been doing tinting for 30 years. It took him all day. Uh, he gave me a price based on like it was going to take him two hours. It literally took him all day. When I went to pick it up, he's like, dude, I don't know if I ever want to do one of these again. This was hard. And he goes, it took me all day. So I, I gave him a, a, a few extra bucks and thanked him. But he's done a lot of work for me. But I think it looks great, particularly on the darker colored lightning. I think it I, I think it gives it a nice customized look. Next up, I think, and maybe, maybe our viewers can comment on this. I think I'm going to put a black vinyl tint on the faux grill. Uh, around the Ford emblem, so I think I'm going to black out the whole front uh, and uh, and and see how that looks. If I don't like it, I could I could always I could always peel it off. That I might do myself um, because that's that shouldn't be that shouldn't be too hard. So that's pretty much it for lightning news. Okay. Uh, we also you mentioned that I put out the the Kia EV6 uh, DC fast charge recording. We did uh, the range test on that a few weeks ago. It went 245 miles. That was the EV6 GT line all wheel drive. Since I finished up with the range test at zero, I did a zero to 100% charge recording. I actually had it for a few days. So I did about five or six different charge recordings. I like to record uh, more than once in case there's a blip in one of the charge recordings. And it was pretty consistent. Um, you know, it, it's a fantastic charging electric vehicle like the Hyundai Ionic 5. I went from zero to 80% in 25 minutes that's good. Uh, that's that's fantastic and i did a bunch of uh 10 to 80 percent charge recordings and on the 350 kilowatt units i averaged about 22 minutes 
Um, I did a couple that were slightly less and one that was a little bit more. That's not quite the 18 minute, 10 to 80%, but you're not going to always duplicate that. It, you know, there's a lot of factors, the battery temperature, the charging station, as Kyle just pointed out, you're going to get, you know, different amounts of power. Um, so um, I got 10 to 80%, 22 minutes on a 350 unit and 10 to 80% in exactly 30 minutes on 150 kilowatt units. Uh, and that's the the charging curve on the 150 kilowatt unit and the the 350 kilowatt, and that's my 10 to 80 percent uh, charging curve there. And uh, you could see it holds over 200 kilowatt all the way up to 50 percent, uh, just about 50 percent. And it does that when you plug in at zero, also. So that nice big 200 plus kilowatt power rate, you get that all the way up to to 50 percent, which is a super boost if you only need to add you know 100 150 miles. You plug in and bang, you're getting 200 plus kilowatt for, you know, up to up to 50 percent, which is really good. It's I average. I mean, the EV6 is a great charging vehicle. It averaged from zero to 80 percent charging, averaged eight miles a minute. And then from 80 percent to 100 percent, you average two miles per minute. So is that I like on to EPA or on your range test. So it was. um so I averaged it. EPA was like 8.2 miles per minute. And my range test was like 7.8 miles per minute. So, mm -hmm. you know, basically it's eight miles per minute. It's yep. really close, you know, either way, Kyle, a uh, little bit more with EPA, a little bit less with my range test. Um, you can so, see it was overheating through your session where these dips happen. I mean, there's always a dip at around 80% where it does a battery check for, you know, 300 seconds or something, but it, yeah. yeah. And, and take a look at that. You see how, when I plug in at 10%, it does it a little bit later at a higher yeah. state of charge. So here's what I, I and I I did I tested it a bunch of times, Kyle. After 16 minutes exactly, it dips, regardless mm. of what the state of charge is. Mm. So that's um, programmed in. So that's interesting. Maybe that's on new software because it's been very pack voltage based for what I've seen. Mm -hmm. um, not so much time based, but it could be basically it's just checking to make sure everything's balanced before it finishes yeah. up to a hundred percent. It could be a coincidence, I, I feel like, but, but you, see, I feel you know, it was 16 minutes, um, b well, b both times. And even when I did the, uh, the 10 to 80% on the 150 kilowatt unit, which isn't represented on this chart here, 16 minutes, bang, it dropped down. Yeah, that, that could be, I mean, that's, that's very possible. Maybe you're onto something there. Cause I've always just looked at, at it around voltage levels and it's always been mm -hmm. around the same. So yeah. Interesting. I, I, I feel like if it was time-based, so like the, the length of time that is it, the, the, the power level dropped would be the same, but it looks like when you, the earlier session, the, the power, the time that it stayed, you know, dipped down there was a little bit shorter than, than the other, than the other session. Right. The time does change. The longest I've seen it is for 300 seconds dip to mm -hmm. basically nothing but that's yeah. starting at below zero and charging it all the way up and it was hot right but they basically don't have the thermal capacity to reach maximum like if you plug in at 50 percent state of charge tom you'll still get 200 plus kilowatts to mm -hmm. 60 or 70 mm -hmm. nice. yeah i I, I, I always plugged in at zero or 10 percent yeah yeah of course me too in in my test but the, on like a road trip it doesn't always make sense to run these things all the way out uh, because they just have a lot of envelope for fast charging. They're very impressive. Yeah. And I mean, I talked about uh, eight miles per minute. To put that into context, you know, it's one of the fastest charging EVs. And I love to talk miles per minute rather than peak kilowatt and how how many kilowatt hour it adds. Because basically, when you're on a road trip, what do you care about? How long do I have to stay and how many miles per minute? And 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 that when you're talking miles per minute, you have to factor in the vehicle's efficiency. It's not just how much power it got. So you can argue, what's the fastest charging EV? Is it the EV that takes in the most power at, in a certain amount of time? Or is it the EV that goes furthest after a certain amount of time of charging? You know, I like to lean towards how far it goes. So now you have to take the vehicle's efficiency. So talking about how efficient or, or, or where the EV6 rates, to go on one end, the Bolt is about the worst. From, from zero to 80% charge, the Bolt average, averages two and a half miles of, uh, for every minute you're charging. Um, as I said, the, the EV6 is eight miles for every minute you're charging. My Model 3 is nine miles. So it's just a touch better than the EV6. Now, it doesn't take in as much power as the EV6 does, but... Uh, or as many kilowatt hour, but it's a more efficient vehicle. So it, it goes a little bit further. Tycon 
is a charging monster. It does about 10 miles per minute. And the lucid air is the king. 16 miles for every minute of charging Ooh, from damn. 0% to 80%. And that might even be improved because Kyle just borrowed a friend's uh, lucid air and did some charging and found out it has a higher peak charging rate than it used to. The Lucid must have done something with their software, which they promised me they were going to. They said they were going to be improving the charging. But Kyle posted a picture of it pulling like, what, 326? When I did my air charge recordings, it met, it peaked at 303. So I uh, wasn't there with the car. This is a friend's car. He's going to let me have it for two weeks in about a week's time. Um, and I posted this picture. By the way, I... I'm full transparent mode today. Uh, Lucid basically said, hey, Kyle, we can't wait to get you in a car. Can't wait to get you in a car. Blah, 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 blah. Never got us in a car. And so I said, okay, we're going to our viewers. Well, no, we'll get you one. Don't worry. No. So we're borrowing a viewer's car. And he sent me a picture of it. He said he saw a peak of 338, 337 kilowatts. He took a picture at 328, uh, sent that to me. I said, hey, do you mind if I post this? Did. Blew up on Twitter. Everyone lost their minds. Is the fastest charging EV we've seen at the moment, I believe. Maybe Hummer EV is close, Hummer. but uh, Hummer, yeah. But um, either way, for a Lucid, it's pretty impressive. And then Lucy emails me like, hey, we can't wait to support you with your loan. And the, uh, like, okay, well, just, you know, I'm going to take the car. We're going to do the stuff. And we're going to share what's actually ending up in people's driveways because my understanding is the software is really lacking on this thing. Um, it doesn't even have lane centering and they're charging a lot of money for this car. So no question the hardware is going to be good. We're going to run it through the hog back test, range test, charging, road trip, the whole bit, thermal performance testing. Um, but no question it's a charging monster. Nice. Uh, all right. Well, I think that might bring us to the end of our show. It's uh, what one? Yes. Wait, so, wait a second. Oh, there's, oh. there's someone here checking the chargers. Oh, okay. What the heck? Yeah, he pulled up in a Nero from okay. California, and he's he's like he's like fixing the chargers. So maybe if we just complain about chargers more, look, he's taking pictures of. I mean, I don't really want to show him on camera, but he's going right, around right. taking photos. He's in high vis, and okay. uh, he's like check, checking on the charging stations. They, Right. I bet you if you go to his Nero, he's like watching his podcast on his phone. Right. I don't know. That's, that's pretty interesting. So that's, that's fast support time right there. There you go. Right on. Okay. Uh, anything else we want to mention? Oh, I did want to mention earlier. I forgot to mention this. Uh, the next generation Porsche Taycan. We've been talking about Taycan a lot today. Uh, is reportedly coming in 2027. It's going to be joined by the electric Panamera. So the Panamera, the Panamera is going to go electric as well. Some people thought it might replace the Taycan eventually, but it's a larger vehicle. So they're going to do both of them, and they're going to be both on the with the SSP platform. Uh, the right, the Volkswagen Group Scalable Systems Platform SSP, right? Uh, yeah, I just, I just wanted to mention that it's still a long ways off 2027, but we're a big Tycon fans here, so it's good to have that news. <laughs> um, all right, so I think that brings us to the end of our show. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. I re really appreciate our, our audience here. You're super helpful, and it's great to interact with you and and see your questions and comments during the show. We love it, and we, you know, really thank you all for for joining us. Uh, so, before you, you take off, hit that like button. We have less than a hundred <laughs> likes, guys. Come on, that helps us out when we get a lot of likes here. It, it, it YouTube then shares it to more people. That's right. Uh, and if you if you have any questions or comments on today's show, you can leave them on the Inside EVs forum podcast thread or on our YouTube or Twitch comment sections. Uh, please give us a thumbs up if you're watching us on YouTube. Uh, don't forget, you can find and follow our panelists on Twitter. Follow Tom Ologny at Tomolog. That's with two M's. Martin Lee is at uh, EV News Daily. There you go. There you go. <laughs> you Kyle forgot Kyle. where Mark was at? <laughs> I know. Yes. I know. Five yeah. years later, like 1,500 podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle Connor is at it's Kyle Connor, which I remember because I just searched his uh, thing a while ago. It's the best. It's the best uh, mm. Twitter name. It's Kyle. Con of course, it's Kyle Connor. <laughs> and I'm at Dominic underscore Y. Click, click subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. We'll see you all again next week. Ciao.